Amen. Do uh, turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 38. After we've read this, we have someone to welcome into membership and to commission as our youth and children's worker. That's Hannah. It's the first opportunity Hannah's been in the service since uh, starting to work for the church uh, because she's been so keen and eager serving uh, in, uh, in, in her capacity there. But uh, we'll do that in just a moment. So Genesis chapter 38, the whole chapter, 1, one to 30. It's on the screen if you don't have a Bible. At that time, Judah left his brothers and went down to stay with a man of Adullam named Hira. There Judah met the daughter of a Canaanite man called Shua. He married her and made love to her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son who was named Er. She conceived again and gave birth to a son and named him Onan. She gave birth to still another son and named him Shelah. It was at Kizab that she gave birth to him. Judah got a wife for Er, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to avoid providing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight. So the Lord put him to death also. Judah then said to his daughter-in-law Tamar, Live as a widow in your father's household until my son Shelah grows up. For he thought he may die too, just like his brothers. And so Tamar went to live with her, uh, live in her father's household. After a long time, Judah's wife, the daughter of Shua, died. And when Judah had recovered from his grief, he went up to Timnah, to the men who were shearing his sheep. And his friend Hira, the Adullamite, went with him. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is on his way to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's clothes, covered herself with a veil to disguise herself, and then sat down at the entrance to Enaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she uh, saw that though Sheila had not grown up, she had not been given to him as his wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. Not realizing that she was his daughter-in-law, he went over to her by the roadside and said, Come now, let me sleep with you. And what will you give me to sleep with you? She asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock, he said. Will you give me something as a pledge until you send it? She asked. He said, What pledge should I give you? Your seal and its cord and the staff in your hand, she answered. So he gave them to her and slept with her, and she became pregnant by him. After she left, she took off her veil and put on her widow's clothes again. Meanwhile, Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adullamite, in order to get his pledge back from the woman, but he did not find her. He asked the men who lived there, where is the shrine prostitute who was beside the road at N.A.M.? There hasn't been any shrine prostitute here, they said. So he went back to Judah and said, I didn't find her. Besides, the men who lived there said there hasn't been any shrine prostitute there. Then Judah said, let her keep what she has, or we will become a laughing stock. After all, I did send her this young goat, but you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I since I wouldn't give her my, to my son, Sheila, And he did not sleep with her again. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand. So the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, 
This one came out first. But when he drew back his hand, his brother came out and she said, so this is how you have broken out. And he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread on his wrist, came out and he was named Zerar. Great. Now, I've been spending a bit of time studying the, the passage that we've uh, just had read out this week. Uh, and one evening, I sat down after having uh, done some work on it and watched a mindless Netflix series. And uh, uh, there was an interfering mother who had caused trouble for her grown-up son. She came into his room and the son said something like, Oh, what? Are you going to try and redeem yourself now? Uh, to his mother. Uh, And then the very next day, watching a a different Netflix series, completely unrelated, uh, it was about a father who had lost a basketball game and was trying, he said, uh, to earn redemption this year uh, by succeeding in his basketball throne. So he'd been training all year round. And it just struck me afresh. What we're constantly trying to do as humans is to redeem ourselves, aren't we? We're trying to make our lives count for something. Whether we're trying to uh, bring out some sort of purpose and meaning to override the the meaninglessness with which we could view our existence, Uh, whether it's our, 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 our good efforts trying to make up for the mistakes of our past, Uh, whether it's trying to leave some sort of legacy behind us for the short time that we live on this earth. Whatever way we're doing it, most of humanity is trying in some way to redeem ourselves, to make our lives count for something. Either that, or humanity has given up trying to redeem ourselves. So the question is, can we redeem ourselves? Can we succeed in that attempt in making our lives count for something? And and that is connected to one of the key points that we picked up last week as we began this series, Origins, Tribes, uh, particularly looking at the the, the main character of Joseph as he dominates these chapters of the Bible. We picked out last week uh, that, that God is one who redeems the unredeemable because we are unredeemable as humans. And that's one of the questions that that, that lingers throughout the the rest of these chapters ahead of us as we go through the end of the book of Genesis. Uh, How can we be redeemed? How can we find redemption for ourselves? Now, as we talk about this chapter in particular, it might strike you as a bit odd. Uh, As I said, the dominant character of this uh, series is Joseph. But he was, I'm not even sure if he was mentioned in, in this chapter Uh, It's a bit of a strange chapter to have. In fact, it doesn't need to be in the Bible at all. It doesn't need to be there in the narrative flow of what's going on in the storyline. You see, the very end of chapter 37, what do we discover? Joseph has been sold in Egypt to Potiphar. And then in chapter 39, the very first verse, you, you find that we're picking up the story again with Joseph in Potiphar's house in Egypt. There's no need for chapter 38 to be there. And when that happens, it's usually because the writer is trying to make a very important point. God is the ultimate author, of course, of the Bible, and he is trying to make a big point through the inclusion of this story. And let's just say it's a good job we now have trailblazers, the children's work, in action because this story is rated at very least 12, if not higher, if it were on film. There are two ways this story speaks to us and it speaks about our sin. The first way is that we are consumed by sin. So as we pick up on the narrative, if only... Uh, If we only thought about the specific sins that are committed in this narrative, well, most of us would be off the hook. I don't know anyone who has deliberately failed to conceive a child with their dead brother's widow. And so if we're only talking about these specific sins, then we're all off the hook. But really, we need to talk about the broader sins that are involved here. And the first of those sins is seen in the bad choices that are made. Now, I don't want to overemphasize this point, but I think there is something in the start of the narrative, in verse 1 of 38, uh, that Judah isolates himself from his family. 
He was putting distance between himself and the people of God. Or you could say, he was no longer in church. Now, if we weren't at the stage we're at with COVID, I probably wouldn't highlight this so much. Uh, But this is is right at the start for the, the, the chapter of decline for Judah. He was cut off from God's people and they, were a, they should have been a source of mutual encouragement and accountability for him. That's why we have membership. That's why we welcome people into the church as members. Now, even if Judah was able to tune in to the online worship of the day, he's not amongst God's people. And that's a dangerous position to be in. can lead to lacking faith, unchallenged sinful behavior. And that leads to spiritual ruin. So if you're watching this on the live stream and you've yet to come back to in-person gatherings, uh, as much as you might be saving your physical health, you could be doing yourself some very serious spiritual damage in the long run. The longer you leave it, coming back to in-person gatherings. I don't want to overdo that point and great that those of you who have come back have come back and come back as often as you can. We'll try and accommodate as many as we can each week. The other bad choice that Judah makes is that he marries outside the people of God. In verse 2, he marries a daughter of a Canaanite man. And what we see throughout the Bible is that Christians are supposed to marry Christians. It's the emphasis all the way through. Now, it doesn't mean that if you have married someone who isn't a Christian, then your faith is doomed. That's not what it means. But for someone who is seeking to get married or looking for that as a possibility for the future, look amongst the people of God. Christians should no more marry a Muslim who worships Allah, a different God, uh, as they ought not, worship, ought not to marry someone who's a secular agnostic, as many people are today, who worships self Money, success, and any number of other idols. You see, there are no neutral positions. Christians simply ought to marry Christians. So that's the two bad choices that are made. Two bad choices that put him in a very vulnerable position. He's exposed to temptation. He's no longer accountable. He's open to being drawn into greater sin. And maybe we've made bad decisions in our lives. Bad decisions that have put us in vulnerable positions as God's people. I don't know, maybe it's allowing our children to do things on a Sunday that means they can't be among the people of God. Whether it's Sunday sports or uh, ballerina classes or whatever else it might be. Maybe it's choosing not to be among God's people in a prayer cluster or something like that. Or going along to prayer meetings. Because we want to do something else that really we know is less important. Now, some of those choices might be outright sinful. Others of those choices might just be unwise and then leave us exposed to other sins. But that's the first one, the bad choices that we make. The second one is failed duties. So picking up on the narrative again, he, he's married uh, and he gets three sons, they're born, and, and clearly Judah hesitated when he named his firstborn, because he calls him, uh, he hesitated, uh, oh, terrible, honestly. I don't know whether it's my jokes that are terrible or your lack of humour, but there we go. Uh, well, ere he marries Tamar, but then he does something that is wicked in God's eyes and God kills him. We're not told what it is. We don't need to know because it's irrelevant to the story. But he is taken out of the picture for his sinfulness. But then the duty is that the next son in line ought to marry the widow. That's how things were set up in, in that kind of culture. It wasn't just an Israelite thing, interestingly. There were other cultures that carried this out as well. Uh, but it was especially an Israelite thing. And it's commanded in the Bible uh, later on. So the second-born son was supposed to marry the widow and have children with the widow in order to carry on the dead brother's family name. That was the idea. So Onan takes Tamar for his wife. He does that much right. But he also knows that if she has a son, 
then the firstborn line will carry on through that son who is not considered his, and then Onan will be taken out of the picture as having any potential right to claim uh, firstborn. If she doesn't have a son, then he will be the firstborn. Onan will take that privilege. Now, Onan is not thinking about his duty to care for the widow, for the needy among them. But he is thinking about his own gains. He is thinking, what can I get out of this? And notice, he's perfectly happy to have sex with her. He's perfectly happy to gain pleasure for himself. But when he does, he ensures that Tamar does not conceive. You can read the details for yourself. I'm not going to cover that bit. And that's not just something he did once. The, the, the language that is used conveys that this was what he continued to do. This is what he did regularly. And we don't have to wonder how bad a thing this was, that he failed in his duties here. God kills him. God takes his life, in verse 10, to demonstrate that what he does is a wicked thing. Now, with Tamar widowed again, the next thing that ought to happen is that that she is then given in marriage to the third son. But the third son is too young. So Judah says to her, when he's old enough, you can marry him. Just stay in our house for now. But Judah really had no intention of marrying Tamar off to the third son. He's scared that she's a black widow, that everyone she marries dies. And we know this because in verse 11, he's thinking about how uh, his third son might die just like his brothers. And then in verse 14, the third son is old enough, uh, but he's still not given in marriage. By the end of the chapter, in verse 26... Judah finally admits that he would not give his third son to her in marriage. So not only is the second son duty-bound to marry, but failed in his duty, but now Judah was duty-bound to give his third son away and fails in that duty because of self-interest out of his own sons. He refused to do so. We all have duties, don't we? We don't like to talk about duty in this day and age, do we? Uh, But we all do have them. Uh, If we work, we have duties there. As Christians, we're required to work honorably. If we're married, we have duties there. We have duties to our spouses, and and husbands have a particular duty to lead their family, to lead them well and to care for them spiritually, particularly. Uh, uh, Christian children have uh, duties to their parents, If they're younger children, they have one kind of duty. If they're grown-up children with elderly parents, then it's another kind of duty. But we have duty to our parents, don't we? All Christians have a duty to be active members of a church, to be involved as much as they are able to do so. So what are your duties? Or dare I say, what are your duties that you're shirking? What are you neglecting out of self-interest? What are you not doing because it's easier to look after number one? It's a searching question, isn't it? Third category of sin is gratifying desires. Uh, Sometimes our sin is that we just have uh, sinful, selfish desires that we just indulge rather than exercising self-control like we ought to. We just give in to them. Uh, One thing I've learnt, uh, perhaps more recently, is that it's okay to feel hungry. And perhaps this is uh, as a result of all the lockdowns, uh, particularly of home learning that we had to do. Uh, I I just felt so hungry doing home learning, and so I was snacking all the time. I don't know if anyone else can resonate with that. But that's what we do in the West, isn't it? That, That as soon as we feel any pang of hunger, we just go to the cupboard or go to the refrigerator and get whatever we can out there just to make sure that we don't feel hungry, as if, as if feeling hungry in itself is going to kill us or uh, be a very bad thing for us. But actually, it's good to embrace hunger. That's what I've discovered. It's okay. In fact, it's healthy to have times of the day when you feel hungry. And the reason for that is because when you feel hungry, those calories that you've already put on uh, the last time you ate, they are going away, aren't they? They're being used up. You don't have to give in to desires every time you feel them. And that is a very countercultural thing to say in our day and age. 
And it's more than just to do with food, isn't it? Though it does apply to food, it does apply to, to greed of, uh, with food, but it applies to greed of all other kinds as well. It is to do with other desires. And here with Judah, it's to do with his sexual desires. Now at this point, the story gets very twisted. I'm sure you spotted that in the reading. You see, realizing that she's not going to get the third son as her husband, uh, she takes it upon herself to do something about it. She dresses as if she were a prostitute. And she doesn't, uh, well, she's able then to put a veil over her face because sometimes prostitutes would have worn a veil. Uh, And the added advantage of that is that it disguises her identity. And then she waits for her father-in-law. She knows he's coming up the road. He's now no longer got a wife. She has died. So he's, he's single again. And he's on a business trip away from home. Dangerous position to be in. And I think it's quite telling that when the narrative talks about what's going on with Judah, it talks about him thinking she's a prostitute, in verse 15 particularly. But when it comes to, later on in the story, sending a payment to this prostitute, well, it says, not just prostitute, but shrine prostitute that the friend is looking to give a payment for. And I wonder if that's to try and convey that for Judah, this was about sexual gratification rather than idol worship. Because although she was dressed as a shrine prostitute, and although that was to do with cultic idol worship, for Judah in that moment, it was about sexual gratification. Now, in the time that we live in, sex is everywhere, isn't it? And it's freely available of one kind or another. So how are you doing with your self-control? How are you doing with your desires that it's wrong to gratify? And not, not just with issues of sex, but other desires that we have for food, for wealth, for success. What about desires for for ease and for comfort? Are we people who are marked by self-control? Or do we just give too easily in to our desires? Well, the final category is of double standards. We've all had the experience, no doubt, of where we've gone out to meet with a friend for, for coffee or a meal or something, but they forget their wallet or their purse. And who ends up having to pay? Well, it's me, isn't it? It's you when you go out for your friend with that. Well, Judah has slept with a prostitute but doesn't have his wallet with him in order to pay. In fact, they work this out in advance, don't they? But instead of giving her payment because he doesn't have his young goat with him that he's promising to give her, she says, well, why don't you leave your seal, your cord and your staff? And that was like leaving his business card, his driving license, and his passport with the prostitutes. Uh, they're things that he would want back, so it makes a very good, uh, a very good kind of uh, uh, payment in advance, doesn't it? It's all he has of significance, so it's all he can leave. But then later on, when he sends off the goat with a friend for, for payment, he can't find the shrine prostitute, of course, because she never existed in the first place. So they leave it at that. But later on, it turns out, three months later, Tamar is pregnant and she's guilty of prostitution. In verse 24, they they bring her out and say this and and Judah has to say something about this. What's he going to say? Is he going to admit to it at this point? Well, no, verse 24, the end of it, he says, bring her out and let her be burned to death. I mean, I find that flabbergastingly hypocritical. It's ridiculous. He's the one who's impregnated her. He's the one who's engaged her in prostitution, and yet he wants to kill her for her prostitution. Of course, he doesn't know that she's the one he's impregnated yet. It's about to be revealed. But those are some shocking double standards, aren't they? And yet, which one of us can say that we have never held someone else to higher standards than we've held ourselves? Which one of us can say that we've never tutted 
when someone else has been exposed in their sin, when we know we're guilty of, of so much more. We've just not been caught. That's the issue. So those are the four kinds of sins that Judah is consumed by and his family as well. How, how do you feel, though, going through that list of sins? They're pretty searching, aren't they? And I know that because it searches me as much as it searches you. I know my own temptation. I know my own sins in these areas. And no doubt you know yours as well. But going through that list just makes you realize how consumed by sin we are. If we drew out everything that the Bible said about what sin is, we could just go on for days and days, couldn't we? And we would end up feeling guiltier and guiltier. So why, why is it helpful to go through that list of sins? Why do we have those, those categories of sins in this passage in the Bible? It's not just self-humiliation for the sake of self-humiliation. It's not just feeling guilty for the sake of feeling guilty as if that in itself does us good. It doesn't. It's because secondly, we need to be confronted by sin. And when we are confronted by our sin, we have a choice. We can either try and hide it and pretend it's not really there. Or we can be confronted, be repentant, and then be transformed by that moment in our lives as it happens. What do I mean? Well, let's look at it with Judah. Uh, being accused of, of prostitution, Tamar then brings out these uh, items that she's been given, Judah's uh, business card, passport, driving license, and she doesn't just say to him, these are yours, aren't they? No, she's a bit more cunning than that. So she presents the objects and says, make up your mind about whose they are, because this is the man who got me pregnant. Now, that sort of thing might sound familiar if you were here last week. Because last week, Joseph's brothers presented their dad with an object and said, make up your mind as to whose this is. And now Tamar is doing the same. Here's some object, objects. Make up your mind whose they are. And that being the same way of exposing what's going on, that's going to be like a punch in the face to Judah as he's hit with his sin. I don't know if you've ever been punched in the face. It's a shocking thing to happen to you. You're either knocked out, you're completely unconscious, or it's a complete wake-up. You get punched in the face, you're like, whoa, something's going on here, and you either fight back or run away. And that's what's happened to Judah. He's punched in the face with his sin, and he's suddenly awake to how bad his sin is. You see, as much as he was pointing fingers at Tamar in this very moment, he now realizes that she's actually much better than he is. He says, she's more righteous than I am. He is far more sinful than she is. So if she deserved to be burned to death, well, what about him if he's worse than she is? And here's the key. It's when we are confronted by our sin that there is then an opportunity for a work of grace to happen. If we're in denial about how bad we are, if we think we're good people, that we're decent and fine as we are, then there's no room for grace. There's no opportunity for grace to work. But when we realize that we are as bad as we are, that we're consumed by sin, when it confronts us, then there is an opportunity for us in that confrontation to experience grace and grace that redeems us. You see, grace is the kindness of God in that he pays for our sin. He pays for what we have done wrong by, by Jesus' death on the cross for us. And then he gives us all that we don't deserve by making us his children, by giving us an inheritance with Christ. We're given an inheritance with the older son. I mean, that's, that's relevant to what we're talking about here, isn't it? You see, if we deny our sin, if we pretend it's not really there, if we think we are good people, then we remain in our sin. 
But if we're confronted and in that confrontation we, we confess our sin freely and openly to God, if we admit it to him that we are sinful people, then our sin is taken away by Jesus. And it's then that God changes our hearts so that we hate our sin and so that we love to do what is right because we love him who we're serving when we do what is right. And that's enough to make us say no to sin whenever it comes our way, whenever we see temptation. That's the work of grace that happens when we're confronted by our sin and when we openly confess it to God. You see, remember how the story doesn't need to be here. Chapter 38 doesn't need to be here, but it is very deliberately here. Why is that? Well, it's to reveal a few things to us. You see, after what Judah did in the previous chapter, by selling his brother Joseph off into slavery, he needs redeeming. Judah needs redeeming in the story. He's going to be used later on in the story, and so he needs redeeming for that purpose. But just because of his sin in the previous chapter, selling off his brother, he needs redeeming. And the way that redemption needs to happen is by him being confronted in his sin. And not just any sin, but being confronted in the sin of the previous chapter. So Tamar presenting the things in the same way that Judah presented the coat is a way of confronting that very same sin of the previous chapter. And it's by being confronted that God can then do a work of grace in Judah's life so that he is redeemed. And you see that redemption happen later on. Read ahead if you're not going to be here. But for his redemption, the story also needs to continue. For Judah's redemption, for other things that are going to happen as we're going to come on to them, something else needs to happen. Someone needs to succeed where Judah failed. So the reason the story is here in particular is not just in order to confront Judah with the same sin that he's just committed, but also to create a foil, to create a contrast between what happens in this story and what happens in the chapter that is to follow. See, next week, you might know the story, uh, Joseph is given the opportunity to sin sexually, but he resists Whereas Judah gives in to sexual temptation, Joseph resists and is righteous in that regard. Someone needs to be perfect in order for redemption to happen. And for us, the one who is perfect is Jesus. Joseph, of course, wasn't perfect. You can read that in the story. There are little details that give it away. He was human like we were. But we have someone who was truly perfect. We have one who was righteous in every way, who lived a holy life in every way where we failed. We have Jesus as our perfect saviour. He accomplished our redemption. And therefore he is able to credit his righteousness as if it were our own. That's another reason why the story needs to be here. But the final reason why this story needs to be here is because of Judah's line, Judah's uh, heritage, his ancestors, those that would come after him. You might remember that Reuben, the oldest, he has been disqualified. He has committed another kind of sexual sin and therefore he's been cut out of the line. The next two brothers, you could argue that they were cut out of the line as well. They used excessive violence against their enemies. Maybe they're disqualified as well. So the next in line is Judah, the fourth born in the family. So Judah would be the one who takes that line of promise, you would think. The line of promise that is going throughout the whole of Genesis. But he's just disqualified himself. He's committed gross sexual sin, as well as the sin of selling Joseph into slavery. He's disqualified himself, and therefore, has he disqualified his line? Well, he can't do. Because from the line of Judah, there are going to be kings. That's what we find out by the end of the story, anyway. 
So his family line needs to be redeemed as well. And right at the end of the story, he has two sons that are born into his family. And so the line is able to continue. But in order for his family line to be redeemed, he needs to be redeemed first. That's coming up in the end of uh, Genesis. But for this moment, in order for him to be redeemed, he needs to be confronted by his sin and redeemed himself in order to redeem his family line so that from his family line can come kings and one of them would be King Jesus. A king who would come and save his people forever. So coming from this corrupt line, a line that would then be redeemed is Jesus, who died as the ultimate redeemer, the one who would redeem us and bring us to God. We've seen how bad our sin is. We've been confronted by our sin this morning, but that's only so that we can see the wonder of what Jesus has done for us the one who redeemed us, bringing us his grace, forgiving every sin and making us right with God. That is good news, isn't it? 